thank you all very much for joining us today. We've got a great webinar, as always, this lovely Wednesday uh, morning here on the East Coast, Understanding External Wireless LAN Antennas. And we've got uh, a fun audience today. Uh, Mike Bram is joining us, Jim Vada, our Chief Wireless Officer, and also Heather Dremmer, our Dremel, our uh, new digital uh, marketing manager. Welcome back, Heather. So um, with that being said, uh, Mike, I'm going to hand the controls over to you. Jim's going to give us a short little intro, and we're going to go ahead and get started today. Yeah, sounds good. All right, while we transition over to Mike, just want to introduce him. He's um, a sales engineer here at Seven Signal. Um, he's been with the company for a long time. What's it been, six years, Mike, or seven years now? Yeah, I think so. I've about lost track. Mm -hmm. And he's an expert in all things Wi-Fi and uh, in particular, you know, layer one RF stuff, just like uh, antennas. So we're really pleased for him to join us today. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm uh, excited to, to do this one. I always enjoy antenna oriented presentations. And Don said, you know, do something about antennas or high density or something. So I, I kind of rolled them together and thought we would, uh, we would talk about in high density environments and uh, it's a little bit unstructured, but hopefully there'll be something interesting in there. Um, yep, and we have an agenda as, as well. Um, but I, uh, I thought I would start with you know, what is high density? People talk about it a lot. Um, I Googled a little bit to see, you know, what what definitions came up and and I came up some about devices per square foot and some discussions about AP density versus client density. And uh, so I sort of decided that I would I would roll my own definition and um, I came up with that it. it's a network design that provides additional capacity uh, beyond what would be provided by a, uh, a coverage only uh, type design. Um, how does that sound, Jim? Do I, you think I got, got close to the heart of the matter there? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, when, when simply meeting a coverage requirement isn't, isn't enough, when you have kind of any capacity to think about at all. Now we're sort of increasing the density of APs, you know, to respond to an increase in density of end users. Um, so yeah. it's, it's uh, I think it makes sense to use a pretty broad definition for this. Yeah, I, I thought so. And, you know, I thought a little bit about what sorts of places might be, you know, high density and, and certainly the access point manufacturers really want everything to be high density, but uh, you know, I gave it a little bit of a thought and I'm like, well, you know, conference room, which is, is maybe 15 people and uh, assuming a gigabit of capacity on the access point, which I think is, is reasonable. Modern access points certainly can exceed that in aggregate capacity, but I think mostly they're still being wired with gigabit cables. So, so I did the division there and, and that's about 60 megabits per person. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's probably not what we would consider high density. Uh, you know, certainly you're, you're probably going to put an access point in a conference room, certainly in an executive conference room, but uh, uh, it, it's probably going to be part of the coverage plan. Um, what do you think, Jim? Conference room, not really high density? No, oh, I think it is. Um, think because, so? yeah, I mean, you know, if you've got, it I guess it depends on the size of the room. But usually yeah, the users uh, in there are, you know, actively using the Wi Fi. So, yeah, it's something I would look at from a capacity perspective. And Charles had a similar question. He's asking, does 2,000 square does a 2,000 square foot room with 400 mobile devices classify as high density? <laughs> I would absolutely say that is. <laughs> I think that's a. I think yeah. I think you're at a uh, 
um, you know, maybe over some FCC safety uh, um, <laughs> thresholds at, at that point. Wow. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, a lot. Um, and, and then I looked at a classroom and, uh, you know, one AP per classroom is a pretty common design strategy. Um, and I actually looked it up and, and at least in the U.S., very few, you know, K through really college single classrooms run much more than about 35 students and, you know, doing the division about 25 meg per person. And um, yeah. while I didn't really think a conference room was maybe high density, uh, uh, Jim did. I, I put the classroom on, on sort of the borderline. That's, you know, I'm not sure that I would put two APs in a typical classroom, but maybe I would. What do you think, Jim? I'm, I'm feeling confident that you definitely think it's a multiple AP kind of a situation. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't put more than one AP in a classroom just because of the uh, the channel reuse issues you get into pretty quickly. So yeah, you do. Yeah. I think the only thing that really saves you at one AP per classroom is that schools tend to be pretty heavily built, and usually there's there's really solid walls between classrooms and that sort of thing. Um, you know, and then I looked up a, up a step, a lecture hall or an auditorium or maybe a church or, or something like that. Um, and, and I said, well, you know, uh, uh, two APs might technically cover a lecture hall that would hold maybe 300 students, but that's only going to be five megabits per second per person. And I think that that's, that's definitely into the... Uh, into the high density realm there you're you're definitely going to have a lot more APs in those situations than you would just for coverage um, and and then the the last three I think are clearly in, in that that category you know conference hall could have really shoulder to shoulder people the same with airports and and really arenas and stadiums are are kind of their own animal for high densities because it's you know, in a lot of cases, it's really just one big room with tens of thousands of people in it. Um, what do you think, Jim? Did, did I yeah, get those yeah. right? I think so. I mean, it's a, you know, what you, you can gather from this is there's a spectrum come from yeah. you know, uh, on the lower end of density, like a conference room, all the way up to, you know, a stadium with 100,000 people and hundreds of people, you know, packed into a small area uh, that one AP is going to service. So there's a spectrum for sure, all of which, you know, needs you to consider the capacity requirements of those those areas. Yeah, none of this really works unless you start out by figuring out what kind of capacity you need. Um, absolutely. Um, and I wanted to, to add a few words here about 2.4 gigahertz and high density. Um, and my thinking on it is really don't even try. Um, I went and, and found, uh, and this is a large public building here, uh, and I looked at just how much management traffic was on the network, which is going to be probes and probe responses and beacons and that sort of thing. And, and really it's, it's mostly probe responses. Um, and our gray line here is 2.4 gigahertz. Um, they've got the, the minimum required data rate set to 11. They do want to support legacy clients there. But about 20% of the APs have 2.4 active. They turned off the the two four radios on the rest of them. Uh, the blue line is five gigahertz, um, and it's set as 12 megabits uh, as, as the lowest basic data rate. So about this, and 100% of the APs are turned on. And, and just look at the difference in how much of the spectrum you're spending on, you know, really on purely um, management traffic here before any control traffic or data traffic is considered and and routinely that 2.4 network with one in five APs running 2.4 
is every day above 30% and really in some cases above 35% management traffic. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that really trying to support a lot of users on 2.4 uh, just, just really isn't happening and, and you shouldn't really shouldn't even consider 2.4 as part of a, a high density density plan. Instead, make it as thin as you can, you mark it as a legacy network and, uh, uh, and kind of leave it at that, I think. Um, what do you think, Jim? Uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I mean, certainly on the highest end of high density, you see, uh, you see networks that are five gigahertz only because yeah, you can turn on some 2.4 gigahertz radios here and there and get coverage, but it's quickly going to, you know, spiral into a, a disaster. So, you know, and, and in my experience, it's better to have no Wi-Fi than have Wi-Fi that doesn't work. So yeah, that, that just makes people mad. Yeah. And if you're doing it blended, I, I like the suggestion of, you know, splitting your SSIDs across bands. So you have the old 2.4 gigahertz SSID that's like seven signal old or seven signal slow or seven signal legacy. And then you have the nice, you know, uh, SSID that's more attractive, just seven signal corp or whatever it is that's in the five gigahertz band. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, really we're going to be, be mostly talking about five gigahertz and you know, everybody's anxiously awaiting, uh, six gigahertz, I think. Um, we talked about these a little bit on, um, on a previous presentation, uh, but I found this nice diagram and I'd love to be able to give credit to whoever did it, but I actually found it like 20 times on the internet and nobody attributed it. So I'm going to steal it too. Uh, but it's, it's an unknown sector antenna of some sort. Um, and uh, I like the way they've rendered this one. Um, this bottom center one shows the, the coverage pattern looking straight down on the antenna, basically. And that translates to to this uh, this diagram over here, and then of course this is looking uh, at the side view of the antenna, and that corresponds to this top middle. Uh, and then we've got a couple of others. This one on the left, I think, gives you the best sense of of what the antenna pattern looks like rendered in 3D, where we've got a very narrow beam in elevation, you know, up and down, and a very wide beam uh, side to side with a, a few little lobes uh, above it and below it. And then I've never seen uh, this one rendered before, uh, but it's it's staring right down the throat of the antenna when it pointed right at you. Um, and, and you can kind of see that that main main lobe in the center in red there. Uh, and uh, you know how you would uh, how you would want that pointing right at you if you want if you want the best coverage. So uh, just just wanted to uh, to do one slide on antenna charts. Uh, anything to add, Jim? Well, the most common time you see sector antennas in use are on uh, cellular towers, and you'll see yeah you see them deployed in arrays. Uh, so that kind of you know, if you look at this coverage pattern, that kind of makes sense that you have these vertical sectors kind of right next to each other, focused, um, you know, at a downward angle uh, to get uh, as many radios from that uh, tower kind of uh, covering uh, the same area. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and really, you see them some in. Um, what we'll call 802.11-based to based point to multipoint systems. They're not maybe strictly Wi-Fi, but, uh, um, you know, a, a base and client thing where you'll have a, a big sector on an antenna. Um, 
or even sometimes in Wi-Fi, big sector, looking down over a parking lot that you've got to cover at an industrial facility or something. I've used them a lot, a lot there. Oh, there's my, there's my charts. I thought were gone, which identified which which match up with which. Um, I want to switch now and and talk a little bit about uh, internal antennas on a on an antenna on a access point. And here's an example I uh, I just pulled off off the internet. Uh, this is actually a little cleaner pattern than a, a lot of antennas have. They uh, or a, a lot of access points have for their internal antennas. I tend to call those those patterns just sort of the blob because they have you know kind of a blob of coverage below or in front of the amp, AP, depending on how you're looking. But you know, there's not a lot of total gain here. Uh, our, our peak gain uh, and for reference. Uh, on this diagram, the outer band is plus five. The next one in is zero dBi, so the same as an isotropic antenna. Uh, and each each ring is five dB. Um, <clears throat> so here we're we're about two dB peak, uh, kind of down and out. Uh, and this particular one has a a dimple in the middle of the pattern, uh, which is pretty common. Uh, for antenna patterns to have that um, in, in an access point indoor situation, it really doesn't matter because you're going to be so much closer to the AP when you're standing in this area that it more than makes up for for the fact that the coverage isn't quite as strong there. Um, but what I really kind of wanted to point out on this one is that our horizontal gain, you know, straight out from the antenna or, or from the AP you know, skimming just under the, the ceiling, it's still negative two. Uh, so it's, there's really still quite a bit of radiated power horizontally from the access point. Uh, and I have a, a sort of two scale diagram here um, showing that access point, that pattern on a 15 foot ceiling. So not too uncommon for a, a public building. Um, and then I came back and I, I found where we crossed back into to negative gain. Uh, and, you know, it's about 60 degrees out from each side of the antenna. Uh, and I uh, broke out my right triangle and, and did a little math. And, uh, you know, somebody yell at me if I got, <laughs> got this wrong. But, you know, that sort of you know, better than zero gain, uh, touches down uh, about 26 feet out from the AP. Uh, and if you spin that in a circle, that's about 2,100 square feet or 195 square meters. So I think it makes a lot of sense why this works very well in, you know, office environments or, or even a single room in a classroom. That's a really very reasonable coverage pattern. Um, right, Jeff? Yeah, it is. And uh, of course, you know, when you, um, you know, those numbers go down when you add um, uh, obstructions like walls and, and doors and things like oh, that, okay. furniture. But yeah, it does yeah, make yeah, perfect sense for that, for that environment, particularly in a high density context where yeah. you want your cells to be, you know, smaller than the absolute maximum size they can be. Yeah. But the thing with these are, you know, they're they're almost almost not small enough because there's still a lot of energy radiating, you know, out in this area uh, from these antennas. And in a high density environment, that's just traveling down the hall or or across mm -hmm. the building. And, um, even at five gigahertz, it doesn't have that far to go before it's going to be um, <clears throat> intruding on another access point that's the same same channel. Usually, things propagate really well right under the the ceiling level uh, in an open room. So, what you could do is use a little more uh, use an external antenna with a little more gain, 
Um, this one is, is about 8 dB. And if you track back down to where we go back into to negative gain again, it's actually still about 60 degrees out. Um, you know, it's obviously going to be a lot hotter right under the AP. You can turn the power down. But the great thing is, if we come up here and we look just under the ceiling height, you know, we're no longer at negative two. We're at, you know, for this one, depending on how you cut through the pattern, somewhere between negative seven and negative 14 dBi. So uh, let's say that it is six dB less. That's half the distance uh, in that horizontal, uh, you know, horizontal distance that you're going to be hearing that access point. And that makes a, a big difference if you're in high density and, and really one of your enemies there isn't so much getting enough capacity. You can always add access points. It's running out of channels. So anything you can do to improve channel reuse is your friend. And using antennas a little more gain and a little or a lot less gain in that horizontal direction is a win. Uh, what do you think of that? You like this better for for shining a spotlight on the crowd, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. A big benefit to something like a patch antenna here too is not transmitting or receiving much signal from the floor above. So when you get back yes. into channel reuse again, you don't want to be putting signal in the floor above, which may cause CCI up there or may cause clients to associate to an AP, you know, through the floor, which you probably uh, didn't design for that to occur. Um, yeah. So, so lots of benefits from that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. um, you know, the other antennas, we were really talking about shining down, you know, getting, 15, 20 feet above the, the, the clients and taking a, a gain antenna and shining it down on them so you get pools of coverage, basically. But, you know, a lot of times going on the walls is great too. You, you still get the advantage of, um, of that gain uh, and therefore sort of some isolation from the access points. And this, this particular antenna is a uh, 45 degree sector. Um, and so in the, the horizontal, the azimuth plane, it's got this beautiful lobe. And you know, I probably shouldn't have picked this exact antenna because it's kind of an expensive antenna. Um, but it has this beautiful pattern I couldn't resist. And then uh, in the horizontal, plane uh or in the vertical plane rather it's it's another narrow uh <clears throat> narrow beam which is is fine uh if you're going to be shooting sideways at your at your clients uh, and these are great for kind of long narrow spaces uh and you can either run them alternating down the hall firing in so down firing or right side firing to the left and left side firing to the right and just alternate or if you're in a situation where um maybe one wall you can't easily mount things along and you know maybe think airport concourse where one wall is glass or something uh, you can back them all up side by side and uh, they are going to hear their neighbors you know quite poorly uh, because they don't have very much sideways gain at all. They'll hear some bounce, but you know it should just be the, the two or three access points on each side. Uh, so that's another way that you can use some, uh, some antenna gain to, um, you know, to, to isolate the APs and enhance that channel reuse, which, like I said, is more of a big deal than, than just putting enough APs in there for coverage. Um, Anything on the long hauls, Jim? Uh, no, nothing to add here. All right. 
Um, since we're talking about external antennas, uh, I thought that I would talk a little bit about uh, kind of dual band antennas and dual band access points. And you know, the dual band antennas, they're either gonna have connectors on them, which are both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, uh, which usually means there's going to be kind of multiple elements hanging off of uh, off of some kind of common feed line, one that's resonant at 2.4 and one that's resonant at 5. It might be a really detuned antenna halfway in between that's, that's broad enough to cover both. Um, or you're going to have a connector on the antenna for 2.4 and a connector for 5 gigahertz, in which case we really have two completely separate antennas inside the same radon. On access points, you have the same thing. And, and really this, I looked around and it, it varies a bit by manufacturer and, and uh, you know, in, in enterprise and specialty access points, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, variation. Uh, but basically they're either gonna have connectors on them that multiplex 2, 4, and 5 gig onto the same connector. Or they're going to have completely separate connectors, some of which are for 2, 4, some of which are for 5 gig, or some access points even are going to have some degree of software control where you can assign ports to a particular, a particular radio. Um, did I miss any combinations there, Jim? No, I think you nailed it. It's very specific to so, what the manufacturer designed. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, what's okay? Uh, we can always connect a, a two gig port to a two gig port antenna to, to AP, the same for five gigahertz. And then a AP that has the combined 2.4 and five gigahertz, you know, you really need to connect that to an antenna that has 2.4 and, and 5 gigahertz. If you're going to be using, for example, the 2.4, uh, if you're gonna turn that off, then uh, then clearly, uh, you know, it, it's, it's still fine. Um, what you can't do is connect, cross connect them. You know, don't cross the beams. Uh, the 5 gig port on the antenna isn't resonant at 2.4, it's gonna, transmit poorly, it's going to receive poorly. The same goes for the other combination. So you can never do those. And then if you've got an access point with that combined port, as I was about to get ahead of myself, you can absolutely connect that to a 2.4 antenna if you're only going to be running 2.4, to a 5 gig antenna if you're going to be running 5 gig. But those are really the only, only combinations. Um, so just something to be aware of, you know, if, if you're doing some antenna shopping, uh, you know, do dig into the spec sheet and, and see what the antenna ports on it are. Uh, and the same for your AP, uh, you know, what's the, uh, the saying, uh, read, follow, read, understand, and follow the user's manual. Um, and then I think, uh, oh, did you have anything to, to add on, on those, Jim? Nope, you got it. All right, and then the last thing, I think this is the last thing that I had, um, MIMO antennas. You know, all the APs are, are going to be MIMO. They're going to have, uh, you know, two, three, four, eight antenna ports on them. And you may be in a situation where the antenna that you want to use is only a, a, a single element or, or only a, a dual element. So, you know, what do you do? Can you use that antenna? And you can. Uh, you absolutely can gang up multiple single element antennas uh, to kind of build your own MIMO antenna. Or if you've got, for example, a, a four stream AP and, and two dual antennas you can put those those together um and, and you know build your own own mimo antenna um just a couple of of kind of things to keep in mind um 
you probably want to use a single type of antenna. So if you're using a, um, you know, a sector antenna, use the same sector antenna on all of the, all of the ports. Aim them at the same area. Don't uh, don't point one down the hall one way and one down the hall the other way. And remember to keep in mind that probably only one antenna is going to be active for uh, management and control traffic. All of that stuff happens at legacy, and it's probably going to be transmitted out of one antenna. Uh, so definitely keep them in the same pointed in the same area. Um, and you may need to experiment a little bit of polarization. The antennas will be marked uh, for, for their polarization. Um, a couple of good places to start, I think, are if you have four elements, vertical, horizontal, plus 45 and, and minus 45, so uh, uh, an X and a plus laid on top of each other, or all vertical. Uh, a lot of times, uh, building elements tend, tend to be vertical, and as the uh, radio waves bounce around, they will tend to align themselves that way. It's very much uh, environmental. Um, and really, most Wi-Fi clients with very small antennas aren't super sensitive to polarization. Um, so it's likely to work pretty well no matter what you do, but those are good places to start. Uh, anything on that one, Jim? Yeah, so where, what are some environments where polarization really is something to really kind of pay close attention to? Because like you mentioned, um, certainly in carpeted office space with, with the multipath that occurs and, you know, mobile clients in position being so unpredictable, uh, Polarization is, is just, it is what it is, basically. Yeah, it is what it is. It, it tends to get scrambled. Um, where it really matters are where you don't have the bounce. Uh, traditional big outdoor spaces, point to point, point to multi point, uh, they really care. Matter of fact, um, I was doing a big citywide network one time and we put the, put the antennas up about, I guess they were about. 30 stories up on top of a building um, and fired everything up. And our reseller had a, uh, a trailer that just bristled with antennas that they used for testing. And they pulled up into a park and pointed their antennas at our, our back call site and everything worked beautifully. So we were happy and, and we went out and we, we dressed out the, the base site and got everything grounded and, all the cables sealed up and started up one of our clients. So we were like 25 dB below where we expected to be. So we, you know, changed antennas and changed cables and went back to the base side and, you know, undid everything we had done and, and nothing worked. And turns out that the client antennas we were using, the polarization sticker was wrong on them. And the cross pole rejection was about 25 dB. So we rotated those antennas 90 degrees and everything worked like it should. But that's a, a no bounce kind of environment um, where polarization really mattered. Yeah. Cool. And uh, I think we're, we're at q and I think we actually maybe are a minute or two ahead of schedule. Yeah, we're looking good. So we do have uh, plenty of time for questions. So uh, if anybody wants to drop a question in the Q&A panel, uh, we'll get to it. Uh, Mike uh, uh, Forrest, who uh, attends our lo a lot of our webinars, so thanks for showing up again, Forrest. He has a question, and it was really in reference to that um, first antenna pattern you showed us with the internal omnidirectional uh, antennas and he says uh, it seems that that antenna pattern would make sense uh, even in a warehouse at up to 25 feet um, which he says would be better than a canister omni with a donut pattern canister omni I'm not familiar with that that term you heard that before big stick omni oh, okay gotcha I, I agree that that is a great 
great pattern. Um, you know, a lot of times people feel like in a warehouse they've got to go external antenna, and I don't think that's that's the case. If you're, you know, if you're not in a giant, you know, 60 foot ceiling kind of thing, um, I think those are are fine. Why we we frequently use uh, antennas that have got more horizontal gain in warehouses. Uh, is because we want to we want to throw that signal because warehouses is kind of the ultimate low density environment in a lot of cases you'll have more APs than users um, so we want to increase the coverage area uh, and that's why we use those those antennas with gain if you're if you're trying to shine down then absolutely you know a, a patch or or uh, an internal antenna can be a very good choice. Yeah, and one thing to add to that too is the external omnidirectional antennas tend to have higher gain than internal omnidirectional antennas, and the way that affects their coverage is it actually um, sort of flattens the donut. So if you're, you know, just from a, a vertical perspective, that would result in less signal um, getting to the ground if you are, you know, high enough up. So, actually, lead this uh, Mike into a good question here from Thomas. It says, is there a benefit to using an external omnidirectional antenna versus an internal omni if the internal antenna has the same gain? For omnidirectional antennas, probably not. Uh, the patterns maybe going to be a little bit different. Um, the external antenna is probably going to be a little more efficient. Those those internal antennas are necessarily tiny and don't do a, a really good job. If you remember uh, when I pointed out that uh, that internal antenna, the peak gain was maybe two dBi in a very narrow slice. Everywhere else, it was negative gain. Um, you'll get a wider pattern where you have positive gain with like a dipole. Um, so yeah, I think there can be, be advantages. Those little rubber ducks are efficient little antennas. They do a, they do a good job. Yeah, for those sure. Internal it's antennas are just too small to do a really good job. Yeah. You want to sort of, I think in that situation, look past the, uh, you know the gain number and and really look at the um, uh, polar patterns of the antennas and and see what's the best fit for your environment yeah oh and and do be careful uh, i don't think i pointed it out when i was showing those patterns but the one with the antenna you'll notice was marked you know with with dbi gain the second pattern was marked with zero dBi as maximum gain, and then it was negative from that. So you had to know what that maximum gain number was from the spec sheet. So you kind of look at the look at those patterns and actually see what the gain on them is. Um, you know, it's just something to be aware of. Follow up from Forrest. He says. Uh... Canister Cisco external antennas are actually shaped the same size as a coffee can. So I'll have to go check those out. Thanks, Forrest. Uh, ah, question. I think those are the, the multi element. They've got multiple yeah. omnidirectional in there. That's Must why they're be. so fat. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Those are used in uh, external or uh, outdoors uh, environments often. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, Peru, he, he asks, are MIMO antennas directional, like high gain antennas? They can be. Um, really, MIMO antennas just parallel multiple single element antennas, or not single element, but single antennas within the same housing. So they can be omnidirectional, they can be sectors, they can be highly directional. Um, you know, a lot of dishes, uh, going back to Don's 35 dBi question, are 
are cross pole. You know, they've got a vertical and a horizontal element in them. Uh, so those are, in a way, MIMO antennas. Yeah, and here we go. Uh, maybe I've uh, time for one last question, Don, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, but question from Kit, and thanks for coming, Kit. Um, he says. Uh, what do you think of a? What do you think APs will look like when we start seeing um, 802.11bf? I want. I think he means 802.11be APs with up to 16 elements. <laughs> I don't know. Some of them already look like porcupines. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and I think to get yeah to get. Um, you know, the separation, the 16 elements that you want, it might be a pretty large enclosure. We might go back to, you know, those big Xeris spaceships or something like that to oh, yeah, handle all sure. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, for the ones with the external antennas, I think, uh, you know, the porcupine look is, is going to be in. And, you know, if you're a geek, that maybe is even kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll look more like uh, cellular towers with the sectorized antennas kind of in a circle, just, you know, pointed downwards. Yeah. We'll see. I think there's some uh, interior designers that are cringing right now, Don. <laughs> but some gamers that are uh, lighting up. I, oh, yeah. I see all those gamers with their, their you know, lit up uh, keyboards and they've got their killer looking Wi-Fi antenna array behind them. Um, That's right. We're so using the LEDs on the with one of these groups. <laughs> um, but uh, awesome webinar today. Uh, Mr. Graham, thanks for taking the time to put that presentation together and, and Jim, Madden and Color along the way. Heather, monitoring chat. I appreciate all of you. Uh, I dropped a link into chat um, for access to download our antenna selection and positioning guide. I apologize that there's a form associated with it. I didn't have a direct link to the PDF on my machine. Um, so sorry for that short little form you all need to fill out. And I, I saw a lot of form fills come through. So some of you already saw that. Um, we appreciate you all attending today. Um, we've got uh, another great webinar with us uh, scheduled for next Wednesday. So please join us then. We'll get the invites out shortly. We'll have today's uh, webinar archived and uploaded in about two hours. And we'll get that link to you all as well. Uh, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.